Hey, Retcon Raider here. Before we get started, I'd just like to thank the Raiders, the fine folks who help make these videos possible. With special thanks to a nerd in war paint, Antonio Hernandez, Matthew Holmquist, Nathan Welch Jr., and Valenrook. Thanks for your support, guys. That said, let's get started. And welcome back to Baldur's Gate 3, as we finally leave the Druid's Grove behind, at least for a time. We've spent the last several episodes meeting with the locals and trying to disentangle the increasingly complex web of events that are playing out around us. But now, I think it's finally time to get back to some good old-fashioned adventuring. Which, of course, means that we are now headed into completely uncharted territory. This is well beyond anything I've played before, so um, I'm expecting some interesting surprises, both pleasant and otherwise. I've also been informed that apparently we are barely a third into what the early access build has to offer, so um, yeah, uh, apparently we have quite a lot of ground that we have yet to cover. That said, let's get back to it. We'll just start heading west towards that bridge and uh, see what there is to see. You find well, but you're so efficient. Why not have a little fun? Fun? I fight to win, not to make spectacles. <sighs> what a waste. Off to a good start here, Asterion being as, um, subtle as ever. Great to have you along, buddy. Hmm. Is this new? We've been this way before. I feel like we would have spotted that. Yeah, yeah. This spot over here is where we encountered True Soul Edwin and uh, murdered his followers in self-defense. Totally justifiable. Oh, look at that. Yeah, this is definitely new. I do not remember seeing that before. Exsanguinated boar. <laughs> Starting to suspect that Asterion may have been here ahead of us. Strange. It looks healthy, but it's stone dead. The pig's dead, my friend. Staring at it won't bring it back. Come on. We'll never fix these brain worms if we stop and gawk at every piece of carrion you find. Oh, yeah. Well, now we're definitely taking a closer look. The boar seems to be fresh, only a few hours dead. Examining the corpse, you see two small puncture wounds in its neck. And is it dead enough for you? You know something about this, don't you? I... It's been drained of blood with wounds in its neck. It's been killed by a vampire. I didn't want to say anything because I didn't want to worry you. They are ferocious creatures. But don't worry. I'll keep watch tonight. We won't have to worry about nocturnal visitors. Now please, let's go. <laughs> oh, well. That does make me feel a lot better, knowing that Asterion will be, um watching us in our sleep. Scrapwood Shield. A hand-like symbol is artlessly painted on the front of this wood shield. Well, that's fun. I like that there are uh, 
cosmetic alternatives for otherwise normal gear. I suppose more importantly, it also indicates we've got goblins nearby, so uh, we'll have to stay on our guard. All right, let's see here. That was where we saw the Harper outpost, but it also looks like we can get down here. Oh yeah, we definitely want to check that out. Interesting. Huh. I guess I just overlooked that path before. Or maybe I um, deliberately ignored it at the time, since I didn't want to stray too far. Ah, but we've got twisting vines blocking that route too. And we don't have any fire handy, so... You know what? Maybe we can, um, leap over the river from the other side. That would be a bit less obnoxious than dealing with those vines. Yeah, yeah. Let's push across the bridge. Oh, we've got another path down here. Oh man, I am already overwhelmed with the number of um, branching paths ahead of us. <laughs> and once again, cutlery and dishware becomes the most valuable loot we have discovered. Wow, okay. That is actually a fair amount of loot. Oh, we've got corpses. Goblins and adventurers. I wonder if that's supposed to be the group that um, lost Halsum. If that's the case, they didn't get very far. Dead goblins. Dead travelers. Were they heading to the Druid's Grove? Hmm. Party cleric. Goblin's drawing. A childlike charcoal drawing of three stick figures. Intriguing. Let's have a closer look. Drawn in thick charcoal lines upon an animal skin, this childlike portrait depicts three stick figures. A goblin with sparks in its hand, a square humanoid figure, and what seems to be an elf. Each of them is wearing a simple crown. Oh, okay. I I think I get it. That would be Priestess Gut, uh, Chief Razig, and then that other drow that we heard about. I'm guessing they've uh, each got one of these modified tadpoles stuck in their heads. Though I suppose the uh, square humanoid figure could have been True Soul Edowen. No, no. Then they would have included the other dead drow as well. Uh, Sid, I think. Yep, there we go. 
there were three figures in the drawing we found. The goblins must have more than one leader. Let's see if we can uh, divine some extra details. The corpse remains silent. Yeah, okay. The corpse remain. The corpse rem. Hmm. The corpse rem. The corpse has nothing to say. Well, so much for that. Um. Oh, looks like we've got one more. Goblins ahead. Looks like they're laying an ambush. Ah, okay. Okay. Oh, wow. They're actually up on the rooftops. Yep, we've got some on the other side, too. We are definitely not going in that way, because that would be a death trap. We'll have to see if we can uh, find an alternate entrance, uh, even the playing field a bit, before we take those guys on. remains silent. Of course it does. It's a corpse. Why would corpses have anything to say? All right, all right. Well, we're obviously not going in this way. So we'll start working our way around. But I also want to check out this cave. Oh, right. And um, we still need to look at that pod across the river, too. for you in Baldur's Gate, Astarian. A sweetheart, perhaps? Not one in particular. The city is a veritable feast of sweethearts. You must be eager to get back, then. Slimmer pickings out in this wilderness. I get by, continued Asterion. I still find the occasional fascinating individual I can really sink my teeth into. Then he threw back his head and laughed maniacally for 20 minutes straight. Everyone just ignored him. Hmm. Random coffin. You know, um, maybe Asterion wasn't being as blatantly duplicitous as I assumed he was. Maybe we do have another vampire out here somewhere. Albert tracks. Its nest must be nearby. Oh, good. Yeah, we'll, um... We'll come back to that. Okay, can't get behind this waterfall. But we do want to check every waterfall we encounter. Because, uh... We know that Chief Razig hid treasure behind one of them. We've actually got a path here. What a weird assortment of items. I'm trying to uh, come up with theories as to why there would be a coffin with eating utensils and boots nearby. And I am not coming up with much that is uh, remotely plausible. Oh, more loot. We'll have to uh, earmark that for later investigation.
<laughs> That's a very nice scenery. Another pod from the ship. Could there be other survivors? Ugh. Smells like rotten eggs. Ugh, that smell. Hmm. Oh, you know what? I bet this was Will's pod. Uh, the rotten egg smell would indicate sulfur, which would definitely link to his patron. I'm betting that uh, he crash-landed here and then his patron helped bust him out. Interesting, but I'm not sure what we can actually do with that. Maybe if we actually had him in the party. I wonder if Will would actually start out here. If you, uh... If you chose him as your main. All right, time for some uh, <laughs> death defying adventure. I'm going to go ahead and set up a quick save here, real quick, but uh, let us face the beast. Onward, my friends. Owl bear nest. All right, let's take this one careful step at a time. That stench. Dead Albert prey, no doubt. Hmm. Rocks and gold. Given that we uh, also just found a pickaxe, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to make the connection. Let's see what this guy has to say. The corpse remains silent. Sure, right. How to say, I really wish they had more um, chatty corpses in this game. Oh, hey. That's... intriguing. Looks like that gives us an alternate route to the owl bear too. Though, um, I think we're just going to take it head on. Might as well leverage our ability to uh, speak with animals. Um, a, a Sterion? Alright, buddy, where are you going? Stop. Huh. Well, on the bright side, I guess he did, um, scout out that trine for us. Still, I gotta say, him being a vampire is really starting to become a bit of a problem. All right, let's just uh, hop across. We'll take on the owl bear, and then we'll go check out that shrine. Ah. Oh, there we go. <laughs> that is a. Oh man. Are they going to make us kill the world's fluffiest owl bear cub?
distressed. The owlbear has sustained damage to its eye. It cannot make critical hits and has disadvantage on perception checks. Interesting. Okay, well, we'll uh, just approach this thing openly. I mean, it would probably be smarter to sneak up on it, but I do want to see what it has to say. Hmm. Not sure how close I have to get. You feel the quake of its heavy footsteps before you see it. An owl bear, its beaked face looming out of the darkness. What's this? Something weak, something tender. Won't even have to chew you before I feed you to my son. Soft meat. Oh, good. Um... Glad to see we're off on the right foot here. You are injured. There is still half a spear lodged in your head. It's a splinter. I've got a bigger threats than you with worse. Well, um, <laughs> okay. Let me go, or you will watch your cub die before I finish you. Oh, good. I'll tear you in half before you touch a feather on his head. Well, here I am. Oh, no, we do have to fight the cub. Now, now I'm really bummed out. Well, that's, that's interesting, I guess. Still bummed out, though. The Sacrificial Imp leads the charge. Nice. Um, I think we'll bring a Luthan in a lot more cautiously. We don't want him taking the brunt of the initial assault. Oh. Well, there goes our shield of faith. Man, it is really hard to maintain concentration spells. Cool. Cool. You know what? Let's um, try that again. Oh, good. Even better. All right. All right. Let's see if we can hedge our bets here. No, no. We're better off just attacking normally. Yeah, like that. Still got a ways to go, though. No! Sorry, Fluffball. 
Well, at least that seems to have um, scared it away. Okay, let's get a Asterion up top. That'll get him out of the line of fire and hopefully give him advantage. got darkness issues. Maybe I should swap that axe over to Lazel and have Shadowheart go back to playing Torchbearer. About time we landed a solid hit with that thing. No! What did you do? Hey, you started it. Oh, uh Well that happened. Okay, change of plans. Let's see if we can get her back on her feet. So that, um, that should have... Wait. Does Rally only boost max HP? Because the wording really made it sound like it also provided healing. That is profoundly disappointing. Alright, well, uh, plan C. Nice. Okay, Asterion. I need you to sprint across the field. And then next turn, he can help uh, Shadowheart back up. Yeah, yeah. Then she can uh, disengage and heal herself before the owlbear can attack her again. The cub looks from you to his dead mother. Wake, hungry. A single strike will end his suffering. Okay, well, we're not we're not gonna do that. Come on. Hungry food. You watch speechless as the cub begins to eat his mother. They go for the eyes. That, or we've just prolonged its misery. Welcome back, Shadow. We kind of missed you. That is one thing I don't really like about the current setup. Those death saves and DOT effects still ticking away during post-combat events. Take you. Though, in retrospect, I suppose I could have switched off to a different character, had them uh, tend to Shadowheart so I could take my time with the dialogue. Gotta remember I can do that. Oblivious to your presence, the cub continues to gorge himself 
on his dead mother. Unsettling. Head of a broken spear. A gawking yellow eye is pierced on this broken spearhead. Hmm. We have the haft that we found on True Soul Edwin. I wonder if we can actually re... Rebuild that somehow. The Oak Father's Embrace. Embroidered with a simple maxim. Nature is the true state of the world. This armor radiates a faint divine power. Order of nature. Undead creatures that attack the wearer receive 1d6 radiant damage. Beasts that attack the wearer deal an additional 1d6 radiant damage. Oh, cool. So, basically a trade-off that makes it more or less completely useless. I mean, I guess I could see wearing it specifically when you know you're up against undead, but I have to imagine that beast-type enemies are much more common. Gotta say, I continue to be underwhelmed by the vast majority of the loot we're finding in this game. It just really doesn't feel very rewarding. An owlbear egg. These are supposed to be worth a fortune. Yeah, what do we get for that? Like... 50 gold. Oh, okay. I stand pleasantly corrected. Okay, uh, I will admit that is the single most valuable item we have discovered so far. Though, uh, after the barter markdown, it is still only worth about 300 gold. Pork loin. That's interesting. I wonder if we can give that to the uh, cannibalistic floof ball. Uh, <laughs> okay. Eluthan could not resist the allure of... Uh, Delicately spiced floor meat. Cool. Oblivious to your presence, the cub continues to gorge himself on his dead mother. Well, you do you, little buddy. We will come back to that a little later. Okay, let's go have a look at that shrine. There's magic keeping this chest sealed. I can feel its aura. Intriguing. Wow, look at all this stuff. The War Between Saluna and Shar, a book of religious lore. 
an ancient tome detailing how Saluna came into being along with her sister, Shar. The silver radiant Saluna and the dark alluring Shar complemented each other and brought an orderly distinction between light and dark in the universe. Hmm. That might be a clue to how we're supposed to unlock this chest. We've got a lot of incense here, plus one lit candle. Anything else? You know, uh, Saluna is the goddess of light, so I bet if we light those candles on the other side of this little stream, it will unlock the chest. Oh, hello there. The Genesis of Saluna and Char. A dusty volume that speaks of the conflict between the sibling goddesses Saluna and Char. After Saluna ignited the sun and brought life sustaining light and warmth to the universe. Yep, that definitely seems to uh, reinforce the candle theory. Or maybe not. I really expected that to get a reaction. Hmm. What's that? Selunite prayer sheet. A handwritten prayer to Saluna. A prayer dedicated to Saluna, imploring all to accept the Moon Maiden's blessings and share in her bounty. A prayer sheet? With the same symbol as the one on the chest? Oh. <laughs> well, now I feel silly for overthinking things. I guess that's all we needed. Use this on the chest. No real clues there. Chests unlocked. My prayers are answered. Uh, neat. You should leave it, or even destroy it if possible. Do not be ridiculous. There could be something useful here. This rubbish is an offering to Saluna. At best, it's worthless. At worst, who knows, could be cursed. Do not trifle with that moon witch or her trinkets. Only trouble will follow. Hmm. Are we not supposed to know that she's an obvious follower of Shar? Um, we do know that she doesn't appreciate us prying, so we're not going to bother with the inside check. Not really our forte, anyway. And while we do have an edge on intimidation, we really don't want to push a confrontation with her. Uh, <laughs> if you push her too far, she will actually just straight up try to kill you. We cannot just abandon resources that we might need. Be sensible. Perhaps you can sell them for a couple of coins. Well, that was the plan. Silver necklace. Bloodstone. And an idol of Saluna. 
a statue of Saluna, Our Lady of Silver, the Moon Maiden, gazing quietly at the world. And ironically, the cheapest item in the box. Yeah, so it is basically just vendor trash. Nothing with any utility, nothing tagged as a story item. I guess that's it. An interesting little side encounter. Okay, so we're almost out of time, but I really want to figure out what we can do with this owlbear cub. I know there's supposed to be some way we can recruit it or something. I saw it on social media. But I don't know what we're supposed to do. I'll tell you what, um, we're almost out of time anyway, so let's go ahead and round things out by having a look at those three books I picked up, uh, the ones that we passed back in episode 12. Should make for some uh, informative reading. Volo's Complete Guide to the Behavior of Nymphs. The heavily edited draft of a book that examines the activities of nymphs in great detail. Yeah, I'll bet. The book is handwritten in a swinging scrawl. The red ink of an eager editor slashes through most of its contents. Two inscriptions, each in a different hand, are scribbled inside the cover. V. Absolutely not. E. Dearest Elminster, while you may lack imagination, nymphs, I assure you, do not nor does the public that eagerly awaits this work. I will refrain from publishing this piece for now, but only that I may conduct a more extensive bout of research. Your friend these many years, Volothamp Gadarm, author, researcher, raconteur, etc. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I'm not really sure what I was expecting from that, but that that does seem about right. I've actually been told that apparently I missed Volo back in the Druid's Grove somewhere. I'm actually amazed the dude is still alive. Baldur's Gate 3 takes place, like, a century after the original games. Soul Coins, a treatise. The red leather cover of this manuscript is stamped with a grotesque sigil, bearing resemblance to a screaming face. Academic Disclosure. This research was funded independently and conducted at a site in Avernus, the first plane of the Nine Hells. Candlekeep does not encourage or promote the entrapment of mortal souls. Soul coins as a concept are one of merciless simplicity. The sum of personal and magical essence, the soul, is bound into a minted piece of infernal iron and used as currency by devils and their cohort. They are frequently traded, for their value can purchase mercenaries, magical items, and even fuel the strange engines in the hells. However, there is a fascinating culture surrounding soul coins as well. I spoke to a devil who admitted she has one coin that she will never sell, for it was the bargain that got her promoted out of Lemur status. She connected me to a half-elf warlock who had promised his soul to a coin after death. I was able to look at his contract, which is reproduced below. The next 50 pages appear to be a painstakingly written legal document in Infernal, with a headache-inducing number of footnotes. Lovely. Once again, that does make me wonder if we'll actually be able to spend these things at some point. Apparently, there is a second coin I missed back in the tomb from uh, the beginning of the game. 
I'll have to pop back over there at some point. Though, uh, I will probably do that off screen. Apparently it's just lying on the floor in a corner somewhere. The Approachable East, Volume 2. A slightly battered journal recording Rian Forbeck's travels across the land. The pages are stained with dust and mud, but between screeds about hygiene while traveling on the road, your eyes settle on this section. There were those that warned me against straying from the river, but I was out searching for an adventure, and where better than the fields of the dead? Living in Baldur's Gate, one hears much about this grand grassy plain, but one never visits. And for a place with such a desolate name, it is positively teeming with life. Well, perhaps not teeming, but there are honest farmers to be found there, and a large number of ravens. Alas, I had no time to venture near the huge hills, or barrows as the locals call them, but I am told that ancient artifacts are all but bursting out of the ground. A fine spot for a little relic hunting. Hmm. That's intriguing. I have to imagine that uh, at some point we will, in fact, encounter this location. And maybe we'll get some use out of that weird armor we just found after all. I actually uh, did catch a glimpse of a rather intriguing overland map. Um, an artist's rendition of the world map for Baldur's Gate 3. I'm not sure if it's entirely accurate, uh, but it might be what they're planning to include with, like, collector's edition versions of the game. But it included some very odd landmarks. Uh, a lot of really oddball stuff, like mushroom villages and crashed meteorites, so... I'm honestly not sure what to expect in this game. I mean, honestly, part of me wants to criticize them for being a bit too silly with some of this stuff, but at the same time, I have to I have to acknowledge that the original games had things like grenade launchers and, um, you know, eye-eating miniature giant space hamsters. That is basically a staple of classic Baldur's Gate. So, I don't know. Uh, thus far, Larian has impressed the heck out of me, so... I really should just give them the benefit of the doubt. Anyway, that's time, so we're going to go ahead and hit the pause button, and I am going to go look up what we're supposed to do with this owlbear cub. It is adorable, and I want it. So, we will uh, pick up here next time. Hopefully, with a new owlbear. See you then. Oh, and remember, although I do love playing Baldur's Gate 3, you can find out more about the game by visiting the official website, the official YouTube and Twitch channels, the official social media feeds, or the official store pages. As always, links are in the description. What did you do?